Ahmad Zain Asi. I'm, uh, I work as a scientific collaborator at the uh, Swiss National Science Foundation, and I represent uh, the SNSF uh, in the Chistera Consortium, where uh, I'm also in charge with, uh, with a group of uh, NCPs of the Chistera Open Science Group. Uh, so what is Chisera? I guess most of you know what Chisera is because you've been involved within Chisera in some way or another. Um, so briefly speaking, it's a consortium of 28 funding agencies in Europe and beyond. It might be a little bit more uh, today, um, whose goal is to support long-term research on digital technologies and ICT with very high potential impact. So we try to support excellence pro excellent projects with with high risk and high potential high impact. Um, now the program itself is supported by Horizon 2020 uh, under the AirNet scheme, and as such, we receive support from the European Commission uh, to to manage the project and partly for the co-funded goals to support uh, national projects. Um, now, how does it work? Uh, we organize yearly two, uh, a one call per year on two topics of timely importance, uh, which is done in a bottom-up way. So we have uh, we organize yearly an open consultation where everyone can propose topics uh, of high importance, which are then taken all together in order to formulate two main uh, relatively general, but still uh, narrow enough and specialized enough uh, topics uh, on which we open uh, calls. Uh, with the novelty next year, uh, uh, where we try to organize, uh, where we'll try to organize a call dedicated to open science. Now, all the information can be found on the Chistera website, obviously. Uh, so today I'm going to focus more on the open science aspects, which is a relatively long tradition in Chistera. Chistera, by the way, dates back to 2009 and has already organized uh, more than 10 calls and supported um, tens of excellent projects, multilateral projects throughout Europe. Um, this uh, tradition of openness has always been manifesting itself within the calls themselves where we have always been encouraging researchers uh, to adopt good practices in terms of open science. Uh, to open the publications and possibly the data underlying the scientific publications. But not just, we've already as well organized several activities internally and externally in order to discuss and present uh, new aspects and directions and reflections in open science. An example is uh, the, um, the yearly um, seminar that we organize for Chistera Project in which we have held several times sessions on open science. Now, in the, in the past call, the call 2019, that we have already evaluated and uh, within which projects will be able to start uh, uh, already at the beginning of 2021, we've already started a first step towards a policy in open science where open access to publications has become a formal standard which means that uh, all publications, scientific publications resulting from uh, projects supported within the call 2019 will be within open access. This is a 100% norm. Even though it's, uh, we could already observe very good open science practices in the past calls, now it's becoming a standard and the norm. And we have already also encouraged uh, researchers to also open at their research data in, uh, in the best possible practices. But now we have taken a step forward and, and we have uh, engaged ourselves, we have committed uh, that from now on, uh, starting from the call 2020 that will soon open, all publications produced by Chisera projects should be uh, open in open access and as well as the underlying research data. I will go a little bit more through the detail, but not much since all these aspects will be covered uh, throughout the four uh, modules that you will attend. Now, um, concretely speaking, this is, uh, this is really something pretty innovative at the level of Europe because we are talking here not about a, a policy that applies nationally, 
but a policy that applies multilaterally. So, which means independently of any existing policy at the national level, whether it's existing or not. And of course, it does not imply that every national funding partner has to abide by this policy, but this policy would apply, strictly speaking, to any GCR funded project, but throughout the GCR network. And this is a very important step in this, in this, uh, in this, in this um, direction in open science. And it's very pioneering because as far as I know, there are little Oops, now I see. Can you can you still hear me? I guess you can still hear me and I've become a presenter. Yes, perfect. Um, so I take the opportunity to show you myself as well since we are talking about open science so I can also open my camera. Um, so again, as I said, uh, the goal was really to have a comprehensive policy that goes beyond national practices and that applies throughout the GSTERA network. And this is really the big pioneering step that GSTERA has taken. Now, um, you can go forward, my yes. So as, as already within the, the call 2019, open access to publication is still the norm. But we have taken a step forward by reducing any possible embargo. So no embargoes would be possible. Uh, all publications have to be all the way directly within open access. And now the big step forward is at the level of the research data, which is now also the new norm for Chistera, meaning that any data underlying a scientific publication generated or produced by the project has to be also openly available uh, based on the FAIR uh, data principles. I will not explain what those is. Most of you probably already know that, but this will be covered also within the modules. Of course, this is module, module of special clauses. GSERA does not only support a theoretical or basic science, but many uh, projects have also uh, partners, industrial partners, or, uh, or develop applied research. And in some cases, of course, there might be clauses that, does not, that do not allow or that forbid uh, just simply the opening of any type of research data. So there are special cases, such as confidentiality clauses, which are covered within the policy. All those data and, and details, of course, will be released with the call documents in, uh, during this month and, uh, and will be accessible, of course, through the Shisera website. Uh, so, but this does not, we do not stop here. Uh, when we talk about openness, we talk also about transparencies. And Chisera wants also to be the example of transparency of openness. And in this sense, we are also committed to have our own processes as transparent as possible. And, and, and for this, we constantly revise and uh, continue revising and thinking about how to improve the transparency uh, and the openness, our own processes and, and own uh, documents, internally speaking. But this has also an impact on the evaluation. As a consortium, we evaluate multilateral projects and we support excellent uh, projects within, uh, within our funding schemes. Uh, and this means that we have to guarantee as well the transparency and the fairness of the evaluation. And uh, this is something we have already been trying to, to strive towards and we have decided to also formalize this by signing the San Francisco DORA declaration, the, the declaration on the research assessment, uh, which translates simply our commitment to a fair and transparent research assessment. Uh, and this will continue and we will continue revising and thinking how we could go further within our procedures and guidelines. Now, what does that mean concretely for you as researchers and future applicants and perhaps uh, GSTERA funded projects. This means uh, opportunities and some changes within the way the application is handled. First of all, uh, many opportunities have been singled out and outlined and will be outlined obviously within the call documents in terms of funding measures for publications for sharing of the, of the research data. This is a big opportunity of, of course for all projects because this increases uh, the, the visibility and the impact of the supported projects. 
but this also requires quite some change within the consortium within the project uh, consortia and at the level of the projects we now we have now introduced a new role um, uh, the role of the open science coordinator so every project uh, every application has to set the, designate within the consortium uh, uh, an open science coordinator whose role is to put together the the way uh, the, the dissemination and the, uh, the the data policy of the project uh, through and of course keeping up uh, keeping uh, these those data up to date so through the DMP through the way the dissemination will be uh, funded uh, of course via the opportunities that we offer through national funding measures we also give uh, access and make available several tools that support the implementation of the policy and this is also in part uh, in collaboration with open air uh, for the implement for the uh, submission of the dmp for the way to monitor the projects and we keep of course uh, many resources uh, online available and documentation and of course we are ourselves available uh, throughout the project uh, lifetime in order to provide support and advice on questions related to open science so thank you very much for your attention and I hope you will enjoy the, uh, the, the four modules that have been prepared for you and uh, I remain of course available for questions uh, throughout and I think also take the opportunity to thank uh, the, the team of Open Air for organizing these fantastic uh, training course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmad. I'm sorry for, for the technical inconvenience, but now you seem to be uh, a speaker for this uh, for this session. Um, all the presentations will be available, so I'm sorry if the timing was not perfect um, for, for the uh, slides. I see there is a user uh, while I'm now um, uh, sharing my presentation. There is a user uh, that raised his hand, Horacio Gonzalez Velas. Um, if you, you, if you have something to um, share with us, you have any questions, or please let us know in the chat. Or was that? Um, let me see. Okay. okay. Okay, it seems maybe probably it was it was an error to raise your um, raise your hand. If you have anything to say, you can just uh, drop a message in the chat. Uh, and so I believe we can start with the next presentation. We will have um, at the end a section uh, a session with a discussion. So probably, if you want to. Um, uh, if you want to um, discuss any aspects, we can take it after. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Hamad, for uh, this opportunity you gave us. Uh, me and Eli Papadopoulou, who is uh, my colleague from uh, Greece. Uh, Eli is here with us today. She will uh, uh, participate in the discussion and also uh, she will be one of the teacher of this course. So today um, we're going to have an introduction session about um, the motivations and reasons behind open science and access to research data. So first let me just briefly outline the course contents. Today uh, the motivation will be uh, um, by me and then uh, on Friday we're going to go to deep into the details on how you can provide open access to publication, what it means to have fair and open data, uh, and fair and open software. And then Ellie will uh, talk, you, uh, talk about research data management and data management plan she will also um, show you some tools that you can use. Um, and then uh, we will uh, um, have an, an, an ending session on December 11th, uh, which will be a hands-on session uh, to, get to, uh, to get you to know the tools that you can use in the open science. 
Okay, some practicalities for today. Um, so uh, we have some some actions that we can make to interact. You see, this is a remote session, but still we can try to interact as in person meetings. So you first have your uh, buttons at the bottom of your screen for the Zoom. So you can use the chat for practical messages. The useful links will be shared in the chat uh, so that you can simply click on them and connect. Uh, you can raise your hand um, to, if you wish to speak during the discussion sections. Uh, and then uh, you can use the Q&A button to um, send any uh, questions anytime uh, to the speakers. Of course, we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation but please do not put your questions in the chat because uh, they they could be missed um, in the between of the other messages that are sent. So uh, we will use also an extra um, interactive tool which is called Mentimeter which allows for a quick interaction with the audience. Uh, probably many of you already know it. If you do not know I'll just briefly introduce you. So uh, Mentimeter allows you to respond to questions, answer questions or post any comments or uh, a question that you may have in an anonymous way. Um, so if you wish your name to appear, just please uh, type your name before your comments. Um, we will uh, be able to see the results of the interactions live. Uh, so this is quite useful and you can be able to access the meter from any device. So you can use the, the PC you're using or your mobile phone by simply going into menti.com and entering the code. I will tell you when to uh, use uh, this, uh, this tool. So please do not connect now, but you will be told when you will be able to connect and you will be also given a QR code that you can scan on your mobile. Uh, to use the Menti. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I usually start my presentation by telling you uh, a little bit of myself. I um, am a researcher now at CNR in Italy and uh, I uh, now have open science as my main research topic. But before that, I was uh, a researcher in um, a highly technological field, uh, photonic integrated circuits, uh, where my field of research for 10 years. Uh, so right after I, I uh, ended my university course, I uh, became a PhD student in uh, innovative research. And I have to say that I had a clear picture of how my life would be uh, as a researcher. Uh, so I managed to uh, made uh, a lot of experiments in the lab to travel a lot and uh, to find a very interesting interesting findings and uh, to also participate to um, the, the progress of uh, the scientific pro progress and uh, the research. But then I hit the reality and uh, uh, the, the problem was that I, I soon realized that uh, to advance in my career, the only thing that mattered was publishing in high impact journals and I needed to be cited. And this uh, made me enter uh, what it is called uh, the famous publish or perish paradigm. So researchers today are forced to uh, publish as much as possible, to be cited as much as possible because this will influence their career. Uh, but what is behind all this? Um, well, uh, we have to uh, discuss a little bit about what means to have access to scientific literature today. So what happens to all these articles that researchers write 
in their career. Uh, you probably already know because after the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we um, most of us were forced to work from home. So you probably soon realized that trying to access uh, even your own article uh, outside the, your institutional network is not for free. So you either, uh, if, if you try to access, and this is a, a screenshot of some of my articles that I wrote in the past, if I try to access them from my home, so from my, uh, my, my private network, what happens is that either uh, the, um, uh, the platform is asking me to sign in with an institutional account, or what happens is that all the articles are closed. So this means that I cannot really download and read the article. So I just got a pre preview. Uh, and if I if I try to download them, then I am asked to pay a paywall. Uh, this paywall is what um, is what um, makes access to uh, research findings very difficult today. As you can see, I have to pay uh, $33 to download my own article. Uh, and this uh, leads us to understand how the access to scientific literature works today. So basically, uh, there is a main, um, a main uh, way that you can access your uh, your or other papers. Um, and this is done thanks to your institutions that uh, are paying today subscriptions to scientific uh, journals to let you have access and read the contents of uh, the journals themselves. What happens is that your institution pays and you as a researcher get access to it. But please, uh, I, I would like to highlight that you are getting access and you do not own the papers themselves. Uh, your institution pays to own nothing. This is uh, something that happened after uh, the digital era came. Uh, and so before that, uh, the institutions paid to uh, own the, the paper uh, so the, the, the physical paper and the physical uh, journals were then um, stored in, in the libraries. So you could get uh, to the library and read also old numbers of, of a scientific journal. But what happens today is that if your institution stops paying for a subscription to a journal, then you will not have access even to the old literature that you could get access to in the past. So, um, you probably already know, but this is uh, the right place to highlight that uh, scientific literature is a commercial service. So, uh, it is based on some different business models. We have seen in the, in the previous slides that one of the most used is the traditional subscription-based journal. Uh, so, in this model, research institution pay an annual fee to give access to the journal contents to their researchers. Uh, again, they do not own the literature, but only have access. Do you have an idea of how much this costs uh, for uh, an average institution? Well, I'm telling you now, uh, this cost is about one to three million euros every year for each single institution in the world that is paid to give you access to the literature. Uh, then we have another model that you probably already heard about. Uh, this is the gold open access. Uh, the gold open access journals rely on a business model, which is quite different from the uh, subscription based one. So in this model, uh, articles are published uh, and accessible to anyone starting from the very moment of uh, the first publication. Now, sometimes what happens is that the author is asked to pay for an APC, an article processing charge to give access to the public to uh, 
his or her publication. Now, this also has a cost, as you see, not, a, not all the time, not every single um, uh, Gold Open Access Journal uh, are asking you to pay something, but mo some of them does. Uh, they, we can count them on 27% of the overall uh, journals that have this uh, uh, kind of, of model. And in this uh, specific uh, um, model, the authors are asked to pay about 100 to 600 euros, depending on uh, the specific journal. So you see here the costs are, are of course, uh, less than the traditional subscription based, but these are paid by authors. So each single, um, so the authors of the papers and not the institutions. Uh, then we have another model, which is called the hybrid model. So uh, in this particular set of, of uh, um, commercial available scientific journal, what happens is that we are talking about a traditional subscription based journal that allows you to have a single paper uh, in open access, in gold open access. So uh, the whole journal is, of course, uh, subscription based, so can be read by uh, those paying a subscription. But um, you as an author can decide to uh, freely um, have to have your your content your single article in open access so freely available for the end user uh, to the old world uh, by paying uh, an APC. Now this APC uh, is uh, about half of what we pay for the gold open access model where all the journals all the articles are uh, open access so freely available for the users and the readers uh, but uh, in this case we have to consider that institutions are already paying for a subscription to have their authors freely read the, uh, the papers contained in um, the specific journal. So in this case, we talk about double dipping because we the, the, the scientific uh, um, publisher are asking money but, uh, both to the institutions and to the authors to uh, have different services. So uh, what is the total amount? This is an estimation which is quite old. Uh, we learned in 2015 that uh, the, the overall cost um, uh, for journal subscriptions in the world was about 10 billion dollars. This is the cost, uh, the money that institutions paid at that time uh, to rebuy the articles that their own researchers right so what is the problem uh, well we have uh, several problems here uh, first of all uh, there is no transparency about the deals that the big ed the, 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 the editors make with the institutions we can know how much it costs but we do not know the details so there is no transparency about the details of of the agreements then uh, we learned that uh, the research can be accessed by few uh, only those that have money uh, to, to spend for um, buying articles and with long delays because you probably already know when you submit an article for um, review uh, to a journal, uh, the time that passes between the submission phase and the publishing can be several months, depending on specific uh, uh, disciplines, but uh, we are talking about months and even years for some uh, sectors for having a research published. Uh, authors are giving away their copyrights and they think they have no choice, but this is not true because uh, you uh, have to know that you are the copyright owner from the very moment when you write an article. So once the article is written, you are uh, the author and also the right owner for all uh, the, the copyrights that you have. Uh, and the, um, if you have, if you think of a parallel with the music, when, a, um, when, when you write a song, uh, then you can also ask for money, for example, for, for, um, for distributing this song. And this is the same copyrights we are talking about. 
so you what you basically you do is that when you sign a copyright uh, you give away your rights for free uh, to the publisher but in principle you could ask for money for that or also you could have your say uh, in which of the different rights you can transfer or uh, you can um, uh, you can transfer to the publisher uh, so one other problem that we have is that all these costs that I showed you before are rising every year and we are talking about a one to two percent of a cost increase uh, for subscriptions and uh, also for APC. Um, one other problem is that the APC costs are not usually tracked by the institutions. So uh, at the level of the uh, governance of the institution, the only cost that they see for publishing is the subscription cost, but the APC is paid by the single authors and by the single researchers. And usually these costs are not put them all together. There is actually a quite nice uh, initiative which is called Open APC. They realized a method for tracking uh, the APC costs. And surprisingly, um, the, the institutions that are tracking this cost, they realized that, that these APC taken as a whole is not so different from the cost that they are already paying as a uh, subscription to the publishers. So last but not least, uh, we all know that authors, reviewers and editors are not paid, but what they do is that they're given for free the raw material uh, to the scientific publishers who make a great profit out of it. So uh, the ones that you see here uh, in yellow are numbers uh, from the profits of Elsevier back in 2010. Uh, we were talking about a margin of 36%, which is higher than Apple, Google, or Amazon posted that year. This is because uh, scientific publishing is, is a, a, a commercial activity and the raw material is not paid by the, the publisher because we are all giving the raw material for free uh, to, those, uh, to those people. So the question that I am asking you today is why do we need to spend this large amount of public money to close the research results behind limited access subscriptions, scientific journals? Well, we are doing this and now I'm coming back to the beginning of my presentation because of research evaluation. So research evaluation, and I'm really happy uh, to say, and Ahmad already said, uh, Chistera is, is uh, about to sign the, the DORA um, uh, research assessment uh, declaration. Uh, research evaluation today, uh, unfortunately, is based on bi bibliometric indexes and uh, or, or for a selected uh, list of, of publications and journals where researchers publish their research. Now, these bibliometric indexes, you probably already know about them, they are based on the number of citations that a scientific article is receiving through its life. So we have basically two types of index that are used to evaluate a researcher. And uh, the first one is the H index uh, for a single researcher is a value is, is the number H such that the given author has published H papers that have each been cited at least H times. So this gives us uh, a number of the production of uh, a single researcher and also on, on the number of citation uh, it, his or her uh, papers are getting. So the other index that you probably already know about is the impact factor. Now the impact factor gives us uh, the mean value for the number of citation of the last two years for a specific journal. Now, uh, what I would like to stress here is that they are both based on citation. So the number of citations that article gets, but whereas the age index can be referred for, to a single researcher, the impact factor itself, it's not 
any <laughs> in in any uh, way related to a single researcher but it is the mean value of the citations that a single journal is getting uh, now a little bit of story about the impact factor uh, this index was created uh, by uh, eugene garfield and uh, this person was uh, um, was in charge to decide uh, to which journal uh, his institution uh, could subscribe so um, to understand what which uh, scientific journals were the most used within the single disciplines, he realized that this was a, a nice way to understand uh, to understand this. So uh, by counting the citations and the mean of, of the citations of a single journal, he realized that, that probably those journals were the most read by a specific community. So uh, all these indexes have some criticism, um, where first of all, you probably realize that early career researchers are penalized. This is because they, they simply produced uh, less articles th than their older colleagues. Um, the citation context, and we will uh, uh, learn this today, is not considered. So for example, negative citation uh, are, are taken as a plus one in the count. So uh, we're not distinguished between negative and positive citations. Uh, they are all numbers. Uh, so uh, the the this this um, system is influenced by uh, the limitation of the citational databases. Uh, so these are all owned uh, and and managed by big scientific publishers. So Elsevier is one of them, uh, for example. And uh, th this is uh, they are very limited because we may um, get to know uh, the number of of the H index or the number of the impact factor, but we will not, not we are not getting uh, access to the raw data behind it. So uh, it will be, for example, impossible for us to compute these numbers by ourselves. Um, these uh, indexes can be manipulated easily by both authors and reviewers. Uh, this is done, for example, when a reviewer is asking you to include a citation in your uh, submitted paper. Uh, this is done because uh, people tend to uh, cite um, other uh, researchers that they know. Uh, this is both done um, uh, also in in um, uh, how to say it's it's not said that this is something uh, um, uh, that the researcher are, are are thinking about, but it is easy that uh, groups that are working together, for example, they cite each other. Uh, then uh, th this this way of of evaluating research by this index does not take into account, for example, the number of the authors in a paper, and most important, that they do not take in, into account the contribution that is given uh, by each single author to a paper. Uh, I was working uh, with, uh, with uh, um, a research group uh, when, when I was uh, a researcher in, in the innovative technologies. And this group was composed by uh, very few people, uh, five or six people, but they had a strategy. And every time that one of the, uh, the components of this group was going to write an article, they put all the names of um, the research group in this article. And by doing this, they knew that uh, this way, each of them could increase the number of citation also without having uh, anything to do with, with a specific paper. Uh, what it happens is that this system does not in any way take into account research 
multidisciplinarity. Uh, this is because different fields have different average numbers. So for example, the average age index is different in the ECT domain and in um, the social sciences. So it is very, uh, very difficult that uh, we may agree to um, start a, a multidisciplinary research with a group that has uh, lower averages for these indexes for us, because this goes against our um, uh, the increase of our numbers in, in this sense. So as you may uh, already realize, these, the use of these indexes to evaluate researchers does not facilitate science freedom. So the question here is, what are we evaluating today? Well, uh, there was this, uh, um, uh, this article that was released last year. It is about uh, the evaluation in Italy. And uh, this is just uh, uh, this is such a, a screenshot, but uh, you have the link to the, to the, to the paper here. Uh, this was published in PLOS One. And um, you can see from this graph, uh, by looking at the um, uh, the red curve, that after the uh, university reform in 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 Italy, uh, with the adoption of these bibliometric indexes to evaluate the researchers, what happened is that the Italian researchers started to self-cite each other and cross-cite each other more than it was doing what what they were doing in other countries. So um, having said that, let's go back and see a little bit into the details on how scientific journals work. OK, we have a community. Uh, let's say it is the ICT community. And one author um, uh, makes uh, very good research, and he wants to uh, write an article. So when, what is produced in the first uh, place is what we call a preprint. So the original manuscript that you write uh, is called preprint. Now, when the article is finished, uh, at this very moment, uh, you are the right owner for the copyright of your um, uh, your your work. What happens is that this uh, researcher uh, submits this article to a specific uh, scientific journal. So he sends uh, the preprint to the journal editor. Now, note that the journal editor, again, is part of the same scientific community, so is one of your colleagues around the world. Um, then the journal editor decided that this paper is worth for being sent to the peer review process. And, um, um, and so he, he chooses two or three um, reviewers to uh, read the paper and comment it. Now, these reviewers, again, are part of the same scientific community uh, because they need to understand deeply the details of the paper. Uh, what happens is that they read the paper, they make comments, they ask for uh, some more specific questions, and then they send all the comments to the author. Now, the author receives the comments, and what uh, he does, he writes back to the reviewers and he creates another version of his paper. So now from the preprint, we have the postprint. The postprint is uh, what we can call the final version of your paper. Um, now, this final version is has the same contents of the version that uh, will be uh, hopefully published on the journal website. What happens is that this postprint is sent back to the reviewers, and they can uh, approve of this, or approve or dismiss this version. Now, if they approve the version, this goes directly uh, to the journal uh, editor, the journal publisher. Now, this time, this person is not part of the scientific community. He's a person working for uh, the publisher, and what this person does is that takes the postprint and realize what it is called the editorial version. Now, the editorial version is 
perfectly matching the contents of the post print, but it has this editorial um, line of, of the journal. So it has, for example, two columns, it has the name of the journal in it, has the page number and so on. And what then he does is that it makes you sign a copyright agreement where you basically transfer all your rights to the journal editor and uh, you lose your rights to, for example, republish your paper. Now, the question now is that, uh, having said that, that academic journals don't fund research, they don't pay authors, they don't pay peer reviewers, but they charge libraries and the public for access to research that is publicly funded and they issue copyright violation to researchers. So why do we put up with this? Well, we have better alternatives. Um, there are a number of uh, alternatives that uh, are out there. Um, we uh, have alternatives to the APC based or, or also um, as you have learned today to the um, traditional subscription based model. Uh, to publish our research. Now, these are some alternatives that allows for open access of the last, uh, the, the published version of, of the article and even the preprint. Uh, there was a very nice initiative um, that started a few years ago in the community of the high energy physics, the scope three initiatives, what these people did is that the whole community came together and they asked for a specific um, model for, for their journals and their papers. So what they did is basically went to the publishers and asked to pay not for reading, but for publishing. Then we have institutional publishing. Many universities around the world and institutions have their own uh, publishing platforms uh, that are um, sustained by the institution itself. And then we had uh, also funder sponsored. Um, platform like the Wellcome Trust or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And now uh, from just a, a, a few weeks, we also have the European Commission uh, Open Research Europe platform that we're going to see in a moment. So uh, we have learned how research is evaluated. We have learned about how the, the models of the business models of the scientific publishing work. Uh, and now the question is, where is all the rest? I mean, you uh, are researchers and, and you know that science is more than publishing papers and commercial platforms. So we are missing a lot of the researcher work uh, only uh, because of this kind of research evaluation that we have where only papers count. Uh, we are missing, for example, negative results. Negative results are one of the most important part of science. I mean, why should I repeat uh, a, a research that gave negative results to our researchers in, uh, researchers in Brazil, just because I don't know about it, because no one publishes negative results in papers. We are missing algorithms, we are missing softwares, methodology, we are missing the work behind the peer review, uh, we are missing project proposals, leadership skills, product development, and most of all, we are missing data. Now data, uh, this is a, a famous uh, sentence by Graham still, who is not a researcher, that once said publishing research without data is simply advertising, is not science. So why do we need uh, to share our data? Because, and uh, we already heard about this in Hamad uh, presentation, because reproducibility is key for science, an experiment is reproducible until another laboratory tries to repeat it. Now, let me just stress that reproducibility is still a principle of the scientific method. So data is the proof of your papers. How can others trust your research without accessing your data? Now here we have another problem because not sharing data means basically that the data we are not sharing will get lost very soon. Uh, this here that I'm showing is a research that was 
uh, done in 2013. Here, what happens is that uh, researchers try to find data from the 90s. And they found out that most of them, uh, we are uh, so talking about 80% of the raw scientific data that were collected by researchers in 1990 are gone forever. This is because no one knows where to find it. Now, uh, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to tell you uh, a couple of stories that uh, will, uh, will uh, let us understand more about the importance of data sharing. Now, you probably already uh, have heard about the austerity theory that was quite popular a few years ago in Europe. Now, this theory, theory was based by uh, a series of, of articles that were released by uh, two uh, famous scientists uh, economists, Rogov and Reinhardt. Uh, and you probably already know the, the contents of this research, so I'm not going into the details of this. But what happened was that a few years later that they started publishing on, uh, on these aspects, um, a, a professor asked asked one of his PhD students uh, to um, re, um, recreate uh, the graphs that were inside a paper. Now, this could it, this was possible because all the data that uh, the the um, uh, two famous economists used uh, to uh, to make their theory about the austerity uh, were publicly available. Uh, online through uh, the, the, the platforms of each single countries. Uh, so we're talking about uh, gross domestic product values and uh, um, the amount of debt of a single country. So uh, what the student did was that he, he took this article, one article, he read the article, uh, he uh, created the set of data that the researchers were describing, and then he applied the four formulas that were on the paper to this data. Now, surprisingly, uh, the graph that he obtained were completely different from the first ones. Uh, so what he did was uh, he had to deliver this, this exercise to his professor. And uh, so he made a last attempt. He wrote an email to the authors of the paper, uh, telling them uh, the story and asking uh, for an advice to reproduce the graphs. What they did was simply saying, okay, so we are going to send you the Excel file that we used to produce these graphs. So you're going to have everything that you will need. Now, what happens is that the student found out that uh, the, the original Excel file had errors. So that means that, that whereas the formulas that were uh, described in the paper were right, they made some mistakes in, in converting them into the Excel file. So what happens is that uh, the article that these uh, two uh, famous um, researchers published were retracted and the PhD student um, made a long a list of, of articles citing the original papers and demonstrating that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the results that they obtained in the first place were wrong. Uh, so um, as you see, sharing uh, your research, your overall research work means that you uh, will also give the opportunity to others to confirm and to validate your own uh, findings. Uh, now, we also see that in this period, uh, research is shared uh, in a very massive way. And what we see is that many, many people working in COVID-19 related field are publishing what we call the preprint. Okay, so the original manuscript uh, before uh, waiting for the peer review. Now, preprint allow for a wider and open discussion in science. Uh, the discussion you, you already know and you, you saw from the previous example, uh, the discussion does not end with the review process. And retraction is actually good for science because it means that the community checks the results even outside 
of the official review process. So this is why the preprint uh, are very important because they allow the findings to, uh, to be published uh, without waiting uh, the months needed for peer review. Uh, and on the other time, we already know that we have a good method that is the scientific uh, discussion within a specific community that will help us in understanding which of these preprint can be failed or uh, can, can fail or not. Now, there is a very nice blog, which is called the Retraction Watch, where you can find stories like the ones that I already uh, told you about. Uh, they also have a very nice database where you can find uh, the retraction uh, by different uh, um, topics or by journals or by authors. And they have a very, <laughs> let's say, nice um, uh, statistics and, and they tell you uh, the numbers and, and the most uh, uh, the the, the um, science that uh, scientists uh, they have the most uh, gr the greatest numbers of retractions. Now this uh, connects to what I was telling you about the criticism for the um, uh, the uh, citation uh, based method for evaluating research. Now you remember probably that I told you that the the uh, circumstances of the citation is not consider where we when we talk about numbers. Now this table highlights, for example, that uh, the number of citation before and after the article retraction uh, can be quite different. And in many time, many, many cases, uh, the, the number of citation of an article that has been retracted is higher after the article retraction than before. So this means that we should not, for example, count these in the total number of the citations that an article gets. But indeed, we do not know if this is what happening because the methodology behind the, the citational databases is not publicly available. But uh, after all this story, uh, I have to tell you that this is all about to change. So there is a very large debate uh, currently in the scientific community about a new way to evaluate research. Now, here are some, some examples. Uh, you will find all the links when I will give you the presentation. We are talking about um, DORAS. Uh, we already heard about it. So um, this, this initiative is signed by both scientists and funders. And uh, what they are asking is that please do not use the impact factor or, or other citational based um, bibliometric index to evaluate research. Um, then we have the AUA, the University, uh, the European University Association and Science Europe that are making a, a very big effort in, in uh, discussing and understanding how the research, a new way of evaluating research can be performed. They also signed together a position statement and recommend on research assessment processes. Now, these people are really discussing into the details uh, via webinars and, um, and meetings. They are issuing uh, briefing and, and uh, uh, papers. They are making some surveys around the scientific community to understand how we can change research evaluation. So, um, Having said all that, and having um, having given you the, the motivation uh, for uh, a new way of performing science, let's discuss about open science. So the first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm not going to tell you what open science is. Instead, I'm going to tell you what it is not. The opposite of open science is not closed science, but it is indeed a bad science. Why is that? Because science is, um, you, you know, science is discussion. Why should we close science? Why should we uh, end the discussion and close it behind a paywall? Uh, one of the uh, most interesting part of open science is that science is accessible to all. 
This means that we can involve a citizen uh, and other communities into the uh, scientific uh, um, discussion. Um, I'm going to give you an example. This is a very nice citizen science project. It is a collaborative project named Galaxy Zoo. Uh, what happens is that uh, all the, the, the uh, universe observation data uh, were open to the, the whole citizen, so not only to scientists, but also to uh, to to the people, uh, to normal citizens. So uh, what happens is that uh, um, a Dutch teacher uh, realized and discovered a new galaxy by looking at this data. This galaxy was uh, actually was not seen by the scientists, so she um, uh, she she found it in the first place, and now it has her name. Uh, but we have also other collaborative projects that are um, possible thanks to open science. One is that about Zika. Uh, it is called Open Zika and it is a, um, a, a very huge collaborative project on Zika virus. Uh, you may remember the breakout of Zika a few years ago. And uh, what the scientists did were, was to organize a platform where they can openly share their results on Zika virus uh, all together. Uh, collaboration is key uh, now with COVID-19. You probably already already found out this. Uh, what happened is that in March, when when we had this this outbreak, um, scientists realized that they needed to open everything. So uh, what happened is that also the scientific publisher decided to go and open access all the papers related to the SARS uh, and uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, research. Now note that what they did in March was opening everything, they announced it, and then they said we are closing it up everything in October. So now that we are experiencing in, in the whole world the second wave of this virus, what they said was that, okay, so now we postpone the closes, the close of, of all these articles until January 31st, 2021. Now let's just um, think about this. So we are having a huge outbreak of this new um, new disease and we are discussing about when to close the research about this virus and what about the cancer for example or other uh, other uh, viruses out there. Why we don't open up the research and the whole research so that collaboration can be truly um, achieved. So why do we need open science? Um, well, you, you have learned that, that currently the scientific communication system is regulated by market interest of big, big commercial publisher and outdated research assessment criteria. So uh, we are closing everything be behind expensive paywalls uh, that nobody can afford. Think of your doctor or professional or SMEs. So now the, the system that we are in now is that Every institution pays four times for research. They pay the salaries of researchers, research funds. They uh, pay subscription to buy back their researchers. And then they, they pay for rights to reuse uh, the results. Uh, so all this is done by public, uh, by using public money. Uh, we have seen that every single institution pay uh, millions of euros for subscriptions to journal. And uh, in, in all that, we do not forget that neither authors or reviewers or editors are paid. So I'm just uh, showing you again the numbers that we are discussing here. We are talking about $10 billion, uh, probably more every year. But this is not about saving money. So what I'm going to tell you is not that we should eliminate scientific uh, commercial platforms, but it is about spending public money in a better way. What does it mean? It means that we should open each step of the research cycle. Open science is based on some, uh, some principles. So we are talking about transparency. We are talking about reproducibility of science, collaboration, inclusiveness. So 
not only few but all should have access to uh, the research results accuracy and reuse of others uh, findings open science steps from a concept that is the research that is funded with public money has to be immediately available to the community uh, now in the last years, more than 10 years, the European Commission and a long list of international funders like Chistera made a clear choice towards open science. What it means, it means to give broader access to publicly funded research results. This way we can uh, allow a, a, um, a long list of, of action. We can build on previous research results easily. And by doing this, we improve the quality of results. We can encourage collaboration and avoid the duplication of effort. So we have a greater efficiency in science we can speed up innovation because faster progress to market means faster growth. Uh, we can involve a citizen, we have seen it, and society, uh, and we can improve the transparency of the scientific process. Now, open science is an umbrella term. What does it mean? It means that inside open science, you can perform different actions uh, that will open up your research life cycle. So uh, there is open access to publication and data. We are talking about open education, citizen science, so involving the citizen into the scientific uh, um, uh, workflow. We are talking about open software methodologies. We are talking about open workflows and protocols and software. And we are talking about open peer review. Now, all this is inserted in an environment where we should keep in mind that we need to provide research integrity. We need to change the system that we are using to evaluate research. And then we need to have the research infrastructures and tools that will help us in uh, embedding open science into our workflow. Now, the main pillar of open science is open access to publications and research data. So open access means to allow for free and unrestricted online access to research outputs, again, text or data. Now, be aware because open access doesn't mean that you will have to pay for publishing. And so how can you give access to your production, to your data and to your publication? You can do this through a repository. So what is an open access repository? It is a repository that stores open access digital objects and makes them available and downloadable. So it is a platform where you can both deposit your um, outputs and make them available for the public. Now, one important thing is that uh, uh, these uh, platform deploy a long term archiving policy. So you're not only giving access to your outputs, but you're also uh, preserving them in time. So repository can be of uh, many different types. We can have institutional, thematic, disciplinary, literature, data repository or cattle repository. You can find a list, uh, two lists that will help you in choosing your repository, both for literature and for data. We will discuss about the repository in the next module into the details. But why do we need uh, to deposit in our repository? Well, we said because of two main reasons. The first one is to preserve your output. Now, repository are managed and maintained by institutions, by countries. For example, uh, France has its own um, uh, national repository hall. Uh, institutions like the university or research organization, uh, they have their own repositories. Uh, they are managed by transnational infrastructures or solid scientific communities that implement long term curation and preservation of the contents. So basically your research will not be lost. Then 
uh, repository allow you to share your uh, your results and this is done because the repository provides a public interface that allows anyone to access the metadata of the digital object so the information about your data or about your object and then the author can assign different access rights for the attachments that means that, that your file can be shared openly or you can provide a restricted access to some specific uh, uh, people or for a specific reason. Um, you can assign an embargoed access or a closed access. Now, the embargo is uh, the fact that you basically close um, uh, the attachment in your repository uh, for a number of months. Uh, this may be done because of compliance with the copyright that you have signed with your publisher or for other reasons. For example, you wish your data to be preserved, but you wish to share them only when you are done with your own experiments. Uh, so the embargo basically said, say that you are depositing today and then you are opening in the future. So um, now this ends the first part of my presentation, second one will be shorter, but now I want to make a little pause with you uh, and I propose you to um, go and uh, connect to Menti. Uh, and uh, this way you can respond to uh, the questions that I prepared for you. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to stop sharing my screen and linking the Menti in uh, the chat so that everyone can, um, can connect or if you manage to, uh, uh, um, to use the QR code. So you are now given the link that you can click on and you can go directly to uh, menti.com and respond to the, uh, the question. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, show you the uh, live results of what you are voting. Just let me share my screen again. Um, okay. I believe you can now see my screen. Okay, I see you are voting. So the question here is preprints will get your research scoped. This is something that researchers often think. Uh, that if you publish a preprint, then someone else can uh, go and steal your research and findings. So I, I think Ellie is still here with us. Ellie, can you maybe open your mic and help me in, in commenting the results? Are you there? I don't see you Hello? because yes, I'm yes, yes. I'm here. Uh, so I guess yeah. most of you um, could uh, could uh, vote here and we can say we have half half. Uh, well, I'm going to give you the, the right answer to this. Uh, the answer is false. So actually what the preprint do is that they give you a timestamp uh, and they give you the authorship for the research that is included in the preprint. So uh, that means that actually by publishing a preprint, you can be identified uh, as the author of a research even before it is published in a journal. So uh, this is actually the contrary of what most people think. Uh, so by, by publishing a preprint, your research will not cannot get scooped because you will have the proof that uh, this article is yours. So let's go to the next, uh, the next question. Copyright transfer is required to publish and protect authors. Now, if you uh, refresh your page on the Mentimeter, you will be able to vote. Um, Okay, so many of you are, are answering false. 
Ellie, do you want to comment on this? I see people are still voting. So maybe we can wait for a few seconds more. I think it's a bit controversial the way it's phrased because it is required to publish uh, actually. So mm -hmm. researchers have to uh, sign a copyright transfer, but um, to protect, uh, I'm not sure. Let's yes. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is actually uh, false because it is not. Um, it is not actually required either to publish. So. To, in order to publish a paper with uh, a, um, a scientific publisher, uh, you are not required to transfer your copyright. You could simply uh, tr um, allowing the publisher to um, republish your work without transferring your rights. Because one thing is allowing people to copy and, uh, and um, uh, reproduce your work. And one other thing is to transfer the copyright, so the right to publish to a single publisher. Uh, and it does not protect the authors. And it's, it's basically the contrary. It protects publishers. Uh, against authors, okay. So um, this is uh, this is controversial. So Ali, for you, these are taken for from uh, an article by um, John Tennant that you probably okay. know. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's go to the next. Um, to but, the next but can question. I add something? Yeah. On the yes, of course. Uh, topic because it's it's like a topic that we're discussing the copyright transfer. Since uh, I'm also in the director of open access journals, uh, you, uh, Emma, I think you will uh, mention that in uh, tomorrow yeah. later. Today. Yes. Uh, you, the researchers have to be very careful when reading this copyright uh, agreement that mm -hmm. they're. Because nowadays we see that very uh, many publishers uh, tweak some words to make uh, to, to make researchers, you know, more or less reluctant into uh, signing them. Yes, I completely agree with you. Uh, so these are these copyrights are very simple to sign now, nowadays. So basically, sometimes you sign nothing, but you simply think. On on uh, on something on a website, so researchers do not think too much uh, about uh, the fact that they are signing an agreement with a private um, uh, a exactly. private commercial platform. And and uh, for example, every time you sign a contract, I believe you read it, but. I bet you are reading the copyright and and also understanding it. It's not because we are not able to understand, but it's because these are uh, languages that are used in 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 uh, legal domains. And sometimes changing a word, as as Ellie was saying, uh, makes the the context and and also the. Um, the meaning of a single sentence very different. So the use of uh, single words uh, should be carefully. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see that there are some uh, in the in the Q and A. We have people uh, adding more. Uh, you know. Uh, oh, we have also question in the Q and A. Yes. Exactly. We yes. So I'm I'm reading that aloud so that you also hear it. Can we really? Um, can we really, as authors, refuse to sign? Copyright transfer required by a publisher. Do we not risk the paper not being published? Thanks. Okay. So yes, uh, you risk the paper not being published, of course, because they require you to sign. But what you can do is that you can contract the copyright. So mm -hmm. uh, the the thing is, you are the author. You are the copyright owner. Someone is asking you to transfer your rights to them. It is not that you have to do that. You decide which uh, copyright you want to transfer or uh, which copyright you, you want to concede temporarily, for example. And you could, in principle, also, also ask for money for this. OK? And now, the, the thing is, you should rely on your um, 
uh, IPR or a TTO uh, office, for example, uh, to, to understand what is best for you. Um, and uh, the other thing is that the, uh, the European Commission makes you available a um, template mm -hmm. uh, for uh, contracting the copyright with the publisher so that you can keep the rights that will allow you to republish your work in a repository, for example. So this is something that you can do. I have shared the link uh, for this addendum that you just can commission one uh, in the chat. For yes, so this is a very nice uh, um, resource that you can use. Uh, when the publisher is asking you to sign the copyright, you simply respond with this uh, uh, email template where you ask not uh, to include uh, the transfer of uh, rights or uh, the transfer of specific rights to, uh, to the publisher. If you want, we can discuss this in details in the next module. I didn't include this part, but if you want to know more about the copyright and the rights that you have as an owner, uh, I can, I can um, give you more details. Uh, Okay. Should we continue with the discussion or with uh, yes, we can continue with the Mentimeter and then we can go to the next uh, questions. Great. Now the question here was journal impact factor and journal branding are measures of quality of researchers of researchers. Now you <laughs> most of you answered uh, the right. So this is false. We have learned today that the journal impact factor is only a metric for, uh, for assessing uh, what is the mean number of citations obtained by a specific journal over two years. Okay, so it has nothing to do with the quality of a researcher writing a paper in that specific journal. So, so these are not linked. Okay, so we can uh, go on uh, with the next uh, Mentimeter uh, question. And in the meanwhile, uh, you, you vote, um, we, can, uh, we can answer to the next questions. We have, what are the alternatives? We need to publish in high ranked journals in Spain. Yes, this is also in Italy. Otherwise we're not valued. So we need to sign whatever they ask. This is not true. This is similar to the, to the questions that I gave. You do not have to sign whatever they ask. Uh, you can contract and uh, you can ask them uh, to um, simply to leave you the rights that you need to republish your research outside their uh, platforms. So with this um, resource, uh, this link that uh, Ellie posted in the chat, I will include it also in, in my slides if you want. Uh, you can ask the publisher uh, to consider um, changing the copyright if they want to publish your valuable research, okay? Because once the peer review process has ended and uh, someone said that, that your research is valuable, uh, the publisher can also change a little bit their standard copyright agreement in order to have your research published with them. Okay, uh, we have also the, the um, results for this next Menti. Uh, the question was not all good open access journals require the authors to pay an APC. Ellie, if you want to answer this. A comment, the... the... Yes, uh, so it's most of you got uh, it right, uh, like 20 of you. This is true, not all open um, access journals require you to pay APC, and there is a list of journals you can find out in the DOAJ uh, later today, I assume. Um, yes, I think we are taking the OIJ in the next uh, uh, module, uh, but uh, yes, uh, I, I believe, Ellie, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 27% of the gold open access journal asking for an APC and the rest, uh, so uh, more than 70% uh, are not asking for money to the author. So 
this uh, sentence is true. Mm -hmm. So we go uh, on. Okay, what are the advantages? Now I'm, I'm going to the questions uh, posed by the public while you vote for this new mentee. Um, what are the advantages of open science open data for private research. Is release of metadata only considered open science? So uh, this is two questions in one. Uh, well, um, uh, for what you will learn in this course is about public uh, funded research. Uh, so this is a, this is a quite a, an important principle and concept that uh, we will have to learn. So if our research is publicly funded, then we should make our results immediately available to the society. Uh, for uh, private research, this can still be done. Uh, because what you can do is that uh, when you um, are contracting your grant uh, the, the, uh, with a private publisher, uh, with a private, sorry, funder, you can still ask to uh, um, include the fact that your research results should be made publicly available. Now, this is, it's another question if we are talking about, uh, so uh, a, a private, for example, company uh, asking you for support for delivering a, a new product and uh, possibly protect and um, uh, patent uh, your research. But we will see how this is also um, um, something included in the European Commission, for example, um, um, open science policy. So you uh, still have the right to patent your research if you think uh, you uh, can uh, um, can have any uh, economical or, or industrial um, advantage in that. Uh, is release of metadata only considered uh, only considered open science? Well, it is part of uh, the open science process. Um, this question also allows me to say that open science can be done step by step. You do not need to open everything uh, in, in, uh, in a single time. Um, the fact that uh, for some data set, uh, we only release a metadata is possible and we will learn in this course that for some data is mandatory not to share the data itself, but it is preferable to share only metadata. So this is something that is uh, within the open science uh, domain. The fact that we need to think about is, is it really necessary to close the data? So this will be our the, uh, the question that you will be asked uh, you will be asked to think about during this course. Okay, so we have uh, uh, many people voting for this question. So approval by peer review proves that you can trust a research article. So. Now uh, we have uh, uh, some people answering true, some people answering false. Um, well, I have to say that the approval by peer review does not prove that you can trust an article. We have seen that many articles that went through uh, the peer review process and were successfully accepted by a journal to be published were then retracted. If you go and check on uh, Retraction Watch blog, you will find a lot of papers that are retracted every day. They also have a, a Facebook and Twitter account where they, they post every day uh, more and more articles that, that are retracted. So this is a, a a known phenomena in the in the publishing uh, in the scientific publish it is true that review uh, the peer review is a, a quality process so for these two or three scientists that read the paper uh, they found the, probably the paper um, um, ready to be published uh, but uh, as you have seen today, then the scientific uh, um, discussion continues also after the paper is published. And uh, what I can say, just to close this, is that 
uh, two or three scientists uh, are, of course, uh, only few uh, part, only little part of the overall scientific community behind a paper. So, of course, we can trust more maybe the the, um, the discussion that comes after the article and not the peer review, probably. Okay, uh, we go on. And uh, we have... maybe Emma, sorry, yes. to, to, maybe I can add just a few things of also course. from my experience and, and yes. within research. Uh, it's also very field dependent. I mean, in some fields, yes. the the peer reviewing can last one, two, even more years, like in mathematics. And in the, in those cases, really people try to re really reproduce the results and reprove all the all the theorems that are stated. In some other fields, it can can really last a few days or a few weeks. And in these cases, obviously, peer reviewers did not have time uh, or are not necessarily required to reproduce the data. So yes. it's very much community dependent as well. But I agree with the answer. Yeah, and also uh, for many in many many cases, uh, for example, the data is not available for the reviewers to check. We have seen the the case with the uh, austerity theory. Uh, they did not provide the the the, um, the exact formulas that they used, uh, the Excel files. So even the reviewers were not aware of it. So uh, they just simply trusted uh, the results. Uh, in the paper. So there is another question that uh, questions are, are coming. So I just leave you some some few moments to um, to uh, answer this Menti. Uh, so some journals to offer preprinting your paper in archive during submission. How does that go related to copyright? Where the copyright in this, in this uh, case is on the final uh, version of the paper, which is different from the the preprint. Okay, so every time you have a new version of your paper, uh, in principle, you have a, um, um, you have a new uh, piece of work. So the copyright in this case is on the final version, the one after the reviewing. Okay. Um, Okay, then you have, I imagine that we are also going to discuss open review. So yes, we are in a few moments, right after the um, uh, the, uh, the Mentimeter. Uh, sometimes you can't finish the submission of the final version of the paper until you sign the agreement. So I don't understand how we can prevent this, but I am interested in learning more. Are we discussing about the copyrights? Uh, so are you asked uh, uh, to have the final version of your paper before uh, signing the copyright agreement? So this is probably you haven't seen. I'm, I'm not sure if Julia wants to comment this because I'm not sure I understand the question. But uh, you are this, uh, talking about uh, not uh, having the final proof of the paper in your hand before signing the agreement. Probably this is the case. Uh, but Julia, if you want to comment more in the chat or in the question and answer, then I can understand better your question. Um, okay, we go on. In the meanwhile, we have the um, uh, the we have the uh, the answer from the Mentimeter. Now the question was, why do we need an embargo period for the open access version of a scientific paper to be deposited? So just let me just uh, um, refresh. Uh, re, um, uh, how to say that? Uh, remember this: the embargo is the period uh, where your paper is uh, already deposited in a repository, but it is not given open access. So, if people try to access your paper through the repository, they will not be able to do so. But after uh, the embargo period has expired, then they will be able to download the version that you made available through the repository. Now, the, quest the answers here where the embargo period on green open access is needed to sustain the publisher. So this is not true because uh, the publisher can really live without an embargo period, believe me. Uh, by uh, by uh, saying that this answer is correct, 
in theory, what we are saying is that the added value uh, that is given by the publisher platform is uh, useless because uh, they need some uh, time to have the, um, how to say, the, uh, to be the only one providing this, uh, uh, this paper to gain enough money. Uh, so Send the papers, yes. Yes, to sell the papers. Yes, um, uh, so uh, the the publisher can can really live without the embargo period. Believe me. Uh, otherwise, uh, gold open access journals will not be uh, um, um, one of the possibility that they will have. So. Um, uh, gold open access uh, platforms are the ones without embargoes and they leave, so they do not need that. Uh, the embargo is needed because it allows the discussion on new findings only within the expert community. Um, now, the, the thing is, uh, why shouldn't the other be allowed to read the latest findings? Um, of the research. Um, so uh, the experts can have their uh, discussion also if all the others can read. Um, now, the last was uh, the embargo period is not needed at all. <laughs> so this was the, the right answer, uh, but most of you uh, got it. Uh, so there is no need for the embargo. I mean, uh, we can make uh, research uh, freely available to everyone uh, we don't need to wait. Why should we wait uh, months or years to read the new findings? Um, okay. Um, so we, we have uh, one more. The quality of science relies on, and then uh, you have uh, different options. In the meanwhile, I go back uh, to the question. Oh, no, we, already, we already answered, right? Yes, yes, but uh, Julia commented on... Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Sorry, because when I share my screen, I cannot see the chat, so I... Don't worry. Yeah. Did you want me to read it loud? Yes, loud? thank you. Okay. So, uh, regarding the questions, it says, yes, that was my question, that the journal requires us to submit a final version to publish it, and in the process of submission, you need to sign the copyright transfer, and until you do, you can't submit. And if you don't submit by a certain date, the paper is pushed to the next issue or not published at all. Not sure what happens because I never really tried. Okay, so probably this is a, this is a matter of the platform that you have. But when you say the final uh, sub, the final version, I believe it has a minor changes with respect to the latest one. So probably you only have to move uh, figures or yes, okay, that's why because it's it's uh, uh, basically it has the same contents but it's uh, in a different fashion. It's like uh, the Publish the version and the postprint. Okay, so the contents are the same. And what you are really selling to the publisher or giving away for free is uh, the contents of your paper and the way you um, you um, you basically present them in a paper. Okay, so this is possible because probably the copyright is uh, designed in such a way that you are transferring all your rights to the publisher. And uh, so this allows the publisher all, also to have uh, to put the, 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 the copyright on the new version that you are uh, sharing. Now, these things are very technical. So uh, I, I really encourage you to, um, to discuss uh, uh, the copyright with experts. We at Open Air have, uh, have a team of experts in, uh, in this field that uh, may help you also for specific question. Uh, I've learned during this year that it is not possible to give uh, a, a very easy, uh, easy answer uh, to general questions regarding legal, legal aspects, but you really have to study the single case and the single copyright in this, in this um, uh, case to, to give the correct answer. Okay, I see there is another question, but I believe we already uh, answered this. Journals offer preprinting your paper in archive during submission. How does that go related to the copyright? We already um, we already answered this. Okay, 
Okay, so uh, we go back to the Mentimeter. The quality of science relies on the peer review process after by scientific journals and no one of the previous, oh, sorry, there was a typo, previous answers. Uh, most of you uh, think that uh, um, no one of the previous answers are right. So they were the number of citation of a single pair, paper. I'm very proud of this, that no one responded to that. <laughs> Uh, the journal editorial board where science is published again. Uh, so this is uh, the editorial board is actually a, a board of experts is part of the scientific community. Uh, so this might have something to say with the quality of science published because they are the ones having the final word to decide. So they are part of the review process. Uh, the, the peer review process we have seen that is is a, uh, is actually uh, one of the um, uh, only um, time where our, our research paper is uh, uh, actually assessed by quality and not by quantity. Of, of a citation. So, uh, but basically the quality of science uh, relies on the science community and discussion. So it was uh, no one of the above. Of course, uh, the peer review process is part of the scientific discussion. We will see later today with the open peer review. Um, okay, so let me go and... Uh, uh, okay, there was probably another. Okay, so I'm just uh, leaving uh, this and leave uh, the question and comment for the last. So now I'm closing the Mentimeter. Uh, I see there is another question, Ellie. I don't know if you want to take this uh, while I am uh, preparing the next part of the presentation. Okay, so the next question in the Q&A uh, reads like this. Back to the embargo, it allows for uh, intellectual property rights protection, non-published ideas are patentable. Otherwise, you can simply write an article only after you put up your put up application is uh, your your patent application sorry, is registered. Put up. I, I was oh, trying to grab Okay, up yes. <laughs> so we will see in a moment actually the article publishing and patenting is uh, um, are two uh, ways of uh, uh, how to say uh, um, to to ex um, uh, to protect or to publish your results but they are exclusive so if you patent if you are patenting a research funding you will not then be able to write an article on it and the contrary is also not allowed so if you already publish a paper then uh, you will not be able to apply for patenting. Okay, we will see it in a moment. Ellie, you want to add something to this? No, no, since we're about to touch up on that, no. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going just to share again my presentation and we go uh, on with the, uh, with the, the um, with the rest of the course and then we will have a discussion at the end so please uh, keep on uh, posting your questions uh, in the question and answer box so um, the questions that you answered during the mentimeter were taken from uh, this uh, article that I was citing before. So the article is 10 myths around open scholarly publishing. Uh, you can find the, uh, here a, a simple uh, um, uh, a figure that is included in the article with a, a summary of uh, the reason why uh, these are all myths around the open access, open scholarly publishing. And you will find the, the, the um, uh, so the the, uh, the overall version of this paper in the link that I give you. So I, I encourage you to go and, and read this article. So now um, what we're going to do is that we are going to uh, discuss a little bit more about uh, what a European Commission has done uh, in these years about open science. 
So open science is something that is under discussion uh, for the EC since uh, 2006. So we're talking about uh, almost 15 years. Uh, the, the first thing that uh, the, the EC did was uh, setting up what is called uh, an open science policy platform on eight priorities about open science. Uh, so we have uh, people uh, discussing about the reward, rewards and incentives, uh, research indicators, and next generation metrics we have learned today that this is key to um, embrace uh, the open science uh, the future of scholarly communication european open science cloud we will see it in a moment fair data we will uh, talk about this in the next module research integrity we already discussed this skills and education and citizen science now uh, there are some recommendations that the european community Commission uh, released uh, in 2016 and then a new version in 2018. These are recommendations to the member states and to the institutions to um, for, on, on access and preservation of scientific information. From this, most all of the country have uh, uh, released uh, in a way or, or another a strategy, a roadmap, or are discussing in this moment, like it is, uh, for example, in Italy and also in the in the uh, eastern part of Europe, they are discussing roadmaps for open science and uh, national open science policies. So this is something that is going on. Some of the countries already have uh, very nice roadmaps, like France and uh, and uh, the Netherlands. Uh, then uh, uh, there were a number of group of experts uh, um, from uh, the European Commission that released a very interesting document. These are two of the most uh, famous one, but we have uh, also on FAIR principle and on other aspects. And then we have Plan S. Uh, we will discuss about Plan S in the second module, so I'm not taking it uh, today. But let's see in the details of what the European Commission did. Well, one of the most, uh, um, let's say, the, the biggest changes is that uh, the European Commission is uh, creating what uh, uh, it is called the European Open Science Cloud, EOSC. EOSC uh, aims at creating a virtual research environment to access and interoperate the research data and other research outputs in Europe and across the different disciplines. Now you will find more information in the links that I gave you, but uh, think of it as, as a single uh, point of access for all the research outputs uh, made in Europe and this will be available for the overall world. Um, EOSC is, is built by um, federating the existing uh, research infrastructures that are already out there. And uh, we have several research infrastructure for single domains, or also uh, we have uh, horizontal infrastructure that provide services and tools uh, for the open science um, across the different domains. So uh, it is a very, very important uh, news and uh, a new piece in the open science uh, uh, environment that uh, European researchers will have. Uh, and EOSC is, uh, uh, is entering its uh, um, uh, operational uh, phase uh, starting from uh, January 2021. Uh, the first uh, um, phase, uh, design phase ended, uh, will end in December this year. Uh, so there are a lot of news to come, so stay tuned and uh, keep you uh, informed about uh, the opportunities that EOSCO will, will have for you. So another important news is that the European Commission has, uh, is releasing what is called the Open Research Publishing Platform. Now, this is Open Research Europe. It will be an open publishing platform um, that will offer a service for fast publication and open peer review for research that is conducted under the Horizon 2020 and that will be conducted under the Horizon Europe beneficiaries. 
Now, this platform is not into place yet, but it is accepting submissions. Uh, you will find more information to the link below. And uh, um, so the, the papers are now uh, accepted and uh, um, they will be published in 2021. Now, this is reserved and dedicated to the EC funding beneficiaries and the European Commission is uh, sustaining the platform. Um, so the authors will not have to pay anything. It is all sustained by the European Commission. Uh, the platform will manage uh, all publication, post publication, uh, curation and preservation processes. Uh, we will see in a moment the details for the open peer review. And what will happen is that you will be able to publish your preprints and uh, all the subsequent version, including the final versions of your paper. Uh, they will be open to the end users free of charge, uh, also to non-scientists and uh, citizens, and they will be licensed for reuse. So uh, um, this is quite important. All the findings there will be um, assigned an open license that will allow and encourage the reuse of results. The platform will fully support um, the, uh, the fact that the underlying data will meet the FAIR principles. So you will be asked to uh, um, provide the FAIR data behind your paper. Uh, they will support you in this. So if you don't know what to do, uh, uh, there is a dedicated support and uh, uh, the platform will help you in, uh, in achieving uh, verification of your data. Um, so uh, this is a very, very, very big news. And uh, I said uh, already that the platform will be available online starting from the beginning of next year. Now let's go a little bit uh, into the details on how uh, the Open Research Europe publishing model works. Okay, so the first step is the article submission. This is completely uh, identical to what you are doing now. So what you do is that you send, uh, you submit your article, your preprint uh, to the system. What happens then is that uh, uh, this article will, will undergo uh, a check um, on, uh, um, uh, on the fact that the article adheres to the policies, for example, the ethical policy or the content policy uh, of the platform. And then once this check is done, uh, it will be immediately published. So uh, the preprint will be open uh, from the very first moment. And then um, you will be asked, uh, of course, uh, to provide uh, uh, the data, uh, the position. Uh, so um, the article will be associated and linked to uh, the data uh, that will be needed by a third uh, uh, researcher to uh, validate the results into the, um, that are presented into the paper. So you both publish the preprint and the data. Then uh, the open peer review will start. Now, let me immediately state that the reviewers will be chosen by the authors. This will be done uh, by a very uh, simple process, but this process undergoes uh, um, uh, checks. Uh, for example, uh, um, the conflict of, interested, uh, of interests between authors and reviewers will be checked by the public, uh, the, pl the platform. This will be done also thanks to some uh, specific uh, um, uh, algorithms uh, that they have. Uh, to check, for example, if the reviewer is working uh, in the same institution as the author and so on. Um, now, when I say that the, the authors will um, choose the reviewers, uh, I want to specify that uh, you will first be asked to provide some names for the reviewers when you submit the article and uh, uh, the, the platform will check if they are, there are some conflict of interest 
between you and the reviewers that you suggest this. If you do not suggest any reviewers or if the reviewers that you suggested are not available to review your article, what will happen is that uh, um, the, the platform will look for a um, pool of reviewers and then you will be asked to choose two or three of them. Uh, now, this process will be completely transparent and open. So uh, what will happen is that after you choose the reviewers, uh, the article revisions will start. How will that work? It will work this way. Now the article is published and then the open peer review begins and everyone will see who are the reviewers that were assigned to your paper. Now, bear in mind that everyone will know that you choose those reviewers, okay? So the process is completely transparent. Um, what will, how will the open peer review process uh, go on? Well, the reviewers will read your preprint or the version, the current version of your paper. And uh, uh, what they will do is that uh, they will provide comments that will be published on the platform. So everyone in the world will see um, uh, the comments of each reviewers. And you will be able to answer these comments through the platform itself. So this process will be completely open and transparent. And if you will be asked to provide a new version of your paper, this will be published together with the previous one. And all the versions will be uh, available in time. So you will be also able to go back to previous version if you want to read the previous versions of your paper. Now, what the reviewers will be asked to do, to do at the end of the reviewer process is that every version uh, will be, they will be asked to mark every version with an approved or approved with a reservation or not approved check. So, and everyone will know who did uh, approved or not the paper. Um, one other important thing is that uh, this uh, platform uh, will allow uh, the visibility and the credit for the reviewers. So uh, this is not, uh, this will not be something uh, um, hidden uh, behind uh, the publisher platform, but everyone will know uh, the, the contribution of the reviewers to the paper. The uh, ORCID ID, uh, IDs will be um, use to track uh, the, um, uh, the work, both of the reviewers and the authors. And one other aspect that, that I found very, very interesting in that is that they will allow for transparent core reviewing um, uh, work. Now, it happened to me many, many times in my career that a professor asked me uh, to review a paper uh, on its name. Now, this is something that happens very often. So the, the journal uh, is asking a, a famous expert in a field to review the paper, but we have a very serious problem on ghost writing because often these experts do not have time to take the review process. So what they do is that they simply um, send the, the, the papers to be reviewed uh, to some uh, PhD students or other um, other uh, researchers, and then uh, they send themselves uh, the the comments to the journal. So from the journal side, it seems that this famous expert uh, has made and sent the, the review. Uh, but internally, uh, there are some cases where uh, this is not done by that person. Now, uh, with this uh, core reviewing uh, uh, process, every reviewer can ask the platform to include uh, a core review, uh, a core reviewer uh, together with him or her. So if you see here, it's uh, on reviewer number two, we have uh, Olivier Girard, who was assigned as a main reviewer. And then we have Lucas Sustel, who is helping and core reviewing uh, the paper with him. Now, this is completely transparency of the overall process. And this is how ORE is working, okay? 
Now, apart from this uh, official peer review process, which is open, the platform will allow uh, the other users to comment on the article. And this uh, will be available throughout all the process of publication. So um, as you can see, this platform will allow both for a specific peer review, uh, but also for uh, the uh, community discussion to happen. And um, uh, so this is not the only platform that uh, will have this model. Many other uh, online uh, publisher have uh, this, uh, for example, F1000, who is in charge of uh, uh, delivering the platform to the European Commission, already has, uh, uh, already maintains a platform with a similar peer review process. And uh, this is something that is uh, um, is not new, but it's uh, it's something that we needed again because uh, we will need many other places where we can publish our work. Now, this ORA platform will be included in the uh, evaluation uh, of uh, the next Horizon Europe uh, uh, submissions. And uh, so uh, people will be encouraged to, um, to publish uh, on the Open Research Publishing Platform, but uh, this will not be um, mandatory. So in case uh, you will uh, um, be granted for uh, a project under the Horizon Europe, uh, you, will, you will be not asked to uh, only uh, publish on this platform. Uh, but this is another tool that the European Commission makes available for beneficiaries in case uh, um, your favorite journal said that does not comply with the next open science policy of the European Commission. Now, regarding the policies that we have in, in force now for the H2020, these are, this is a list of documents that uh, you should uh, uh, know about. So you have the model grant agreement where the obligations are laid out, and then you have some guidelines that you can use uh, to understand how you can comply to this, uh, this obligation. Uh, what is uh, what the Commission is asking you in the first place is to decide whether to patent or protect your work or to publish the results of your research. Now, this is what we were discussing thanks to a question before. Um, this is a, a, a choice that you have to make in the first place. And as you see, the two lines are not crossing each other. So either you decided to publish by disseminating your results or you decided to exploit or protect your work uh, through a patenting or other forms of protection. In case you decide to disseminate, then you enter uh, the mandate for open access to publication and data. Regarding open access uh, uh, to scientific publication, this is open by mandate, so every single uh, publication that is done thanks to uh, a specific project has to be um, made uh, open access, uh, openly available uh, to, uh, to uh, the whole world. This can be done also uh, considering an embargo period that in your case cannot exceed six months. Uh, and you have to deposit in a specific uh, a, a repository that is complied, uh, compliant and linked to OpenAir. Uh, we will see in a moment what OpenAir is and how you can find your deposit repository. Uh, you have to deposit either the postprint or the editorial version in a machine-readable electronic copy. Uh, now, the postprint uh, has the same content of the editorial version. By only depositing the preprint, you will not uh, be compliant with the open access policy of the Commission. And also, you have to ensure that the metadata associated with your deposit contains the project coordination. That means the name of the action, the acronym, and the grant number. Now, this is a mandate, this is an obligation, you can skip it. For the data, we have another, uh, a, a, different, uh, um, a different policy. Now, the data is open by default, 
but uh, in fact you can opt out from the open pilot uh, open data pilot uh, whenever you want either at the beginning of the pro project or or after the project has begun uh, you can also opt out for a single data set i will tell you in a moment uh, uh, what are the options that you have for opting out what you need to deposit is uh, uh, basically the data that are produced uh, uh, in the process in the um, in the project um, and specifically those data that uh, are led to a scientific publication but in general any kind of data that you will uh, um, you will generate again you will have to deposit uh, the data and then provide uh, the metadata with a reference to the specific project so the number of the project and again you will have to choose a repository that is compliant with the open air and linked to open air you will be asked also to produce a data management plan now the data management plan ellie will uh, will uh, talk uh, talk to you about this uh, in the third module. The main principle that you will have to keep in mind when you will decide whether to opt out or to close your uh, data with the restricted access is that you should open as possible your research and keep it closed only when it is necessary. When it is necessary uh, are the options for open uh, opting out for the data pilot. Now, these reasons are industrial or commercial exploitation. We have seen in the beginning that if we choose to protect or patent our results, uh, these will not be included in the open access policy. So this is something that you can do to uh, opt out for from the data pilot. If the participation to the pilot is incompatible with the need for confidentiality related to security issues or uh, incompatible with the rules on personal data protection. OK, if the achievement of the project objective uh, it will be um, uh, if the, the project will not achieve their its objectives in case you share your data openly, this is another reason for opting out. And also if you're not producing any data. Now, uh, these are the options that you have. It is not as simple that you can think that uh, you simply write, I choose this option and I'm out. Uh, so this will undergo the review of the project officer and of the reviewers of the project that will decide if your um, um, the reason why you're asking to opt out is reasonable or not. Now, in, in uh, summarizing what actually the Commission is asking you is not to share openly everything that you, uh, that, you, um, uh, that you collect within the project, but to uh, um, perform a proper research data management. Okay, This is why you will be asked to provide a data management plan uh, within month six of your, your grant and to update it frequently. Okay, and you will be asked to adhere to the FAIR principle while managing your data. We will learn in the next module that data must be FAIR. What it means to make your data FAIR is means that your data must be managed so that people will be able to reuse them. Reuse, reusable is one of the, the word that is inside the FAIR acronym, but it is the most important one because everything you will do uh, when you manage your data according to the FAIR is because you want your data to be reused by others. Data must be findable, so it should be clear where data are located and this way they can be cited they should be accessible for at least 10 years. It does not mean that data is open, but it must be clear who and how can access the data. Interoperability is uh, the, the one of the, one other important principle. So data should be easily integrated with other data, machine readable, and linked to other research results. Now, as you can see here, FAIR does not mean open. Uh, but it means managing your data um, in a correct way.
Now, uh, the main principle uh, behind all this is that the data should be open as possible, as open as possible, and as closed only when it is necessary. Now, this principle was uh, stated by Carlos Moedas, who was uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, European Commissioner in, uh, commissioner, uh, in the um, Research uh, Science and, and uh, Innovation uh, Directorate. Be aware because there are sanctions. So grant reduction or payment suspensions are uh, the sanctions that uh, you can go, um, uh, you can find if you do not uh, um, um, comply with the open science policy of the European Commission. Now, uh, regarding KIST era, uh, and open science. We have seen an introduction today by Ahmad. I only have a few slides about uh, the steps that Kistera is taking towards uh, the adoption of, of, uh, uh, of an open science policy. Uh, we started this work in March uh, with a workshop that was organized by Kistera to discuss open science in transnational research. Now, a group of experts came together in this workshop uh, to assess the current practices, uh, the status of the open science policies in the European landscape, and the platforms and the tools that are already available there for researchers. So, the conclusion of these workshops were that um, uh, the, the this era uh, has. Uh, um, um, has entered a, a, um, um, a path for shaping uh, a new open science policies and has defined a roadmap for this. Uh, now, for what concerned uh, today, uh, the open science policy of KISTERA consists in two pillars, the open, the open access to publication and open access to, to research data. So researchers are committed if they are selected to deposit the publication resulting from the project into an, an open archive and are encouraged to opt for publishing in open access journals. For the moment, they must provide, if they are selected, a data management plan together with the, this early, yearly project scientific report that you have to deliver to the funder. Uh, you are encouraged uh, in that respect to adopt approaches as open as possible, and the applicants must indicate their proposal the in their proposal, the guiding principles of their approach um, and, and the evaluation criteria encompassing some dimension of open access and open data, including the reproducibility of the results. Now, uh, KISS ERA has released a, a policy statement in October this year about uh, <laughs> why we need open science, the commitments of the funder, and the implementation. Now, you can find the full uh, uh, statement in the link below, uh, just to let you know that uh, um, uh, KISS ERA um, uh, wants the, the, the fully open availability of the research results free of charge for the user. Um, and uh, this means for them to improve uh, transparency, reproducibility, visibility, and democratization of research. The commitments, uh, this era is committed to implement the best open science practices transnationally and uh, accompany, foster, and trigger the efforts towards the open science Europe. Uh, open Science in Europe and uh, is committed to continuously refine the evaluation procedures, starting from the principle of the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. And now, believe me, this is very important because, because this is the change in the research assessment that we need in order to fully uh, uh, embrace the open science. The implementation will be done by the new policy that will be published. Um, uh, I think uh, Ahmad, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, next year. Um, and uh, the, the policy will aim at achieving 100% of the publications produced by the researchers of KIST era in open access and of the underlying data to be open following the FAIR principles. 
Now, open air is helping uh, many um, uh, many funders, including uh, Cistera and the European Commission, to monitor open science. Uh, what is open air? Open air is the infrastructure for open science in Europe that was uh, um, designed and developed thanks to uh, several projects under the uh, European Commission framework. Uh, so now what we do is that uh, we collected the data coming from more than 17,000 uh, data providers around the world and we build a graph that connects research results, so article, uh, data, software, whatever, with the projects, with the institutions and with funders. These are some of the numbers of open air. So this is what uh, our graph is composed by. We're talking about 40 million publications, 3 million projects, 10 million data set, and this is uh, increasing every day. Um, now, what we do is that we provide through our portal uh, different perspectives of the open air graph by institutions. So each institution um, is, uh, will, is able to go and check what are the projects, uh, what are the publications, uh, the data that are assigned to um, it, his, uh, its uh, researchers. Uh, we provide the perspective of the repository including the, the metadata and their, uh, their contents. We provide a perspective on the single project. So we assign uh, the, the results that uh, uh, each project has developed. Uh, so publication, research data, softwares, other research products. And then we also provide the perspective on a, a single product. So uh, for a single product, we can tell you uh, what are the projects uh, that were involved, uh, where you can find this product, in which repository, if uh, the copy available is open or not, uh, and, and many, many other information and statistics. So what we do is that then we send all this data to the uh, uh, to the funders. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, Horizon 2020 participant portal. So all the data that you find there about the open data and publication are provided by Open Air, and this is what we will do also with uh, uh, with Chist Era. Uh, and then we have a, a network of support, which is called the National Open Access Tests. Ellie and I are part of this network. Uh, which is spread all over 34 countries uh, in Europe and behind. Um, and what we will provide for Chistera is that we will use the open air graph information uh, to uh, make the um, uh, information available for monitor to Chistera. So we have a monitor service that uh, the funder can use for a decision and evaluation process. And and then uh, we will provide some tools. Argos uh, that you will learn to use in the third module is an actionable, actionable DMP tool that will allow you to write your DMP and your DMP will be actionable. You will learn uh, how it works with Ellie. And then last but not least, we will provide the training like this course and support for the researcher for uh, the open science policy uptake. So now this concludes my presentation. I encourage you to go back to the Mentimeter. So let me just close the presentation and uh, share with you the Mentimeter window where you will be able to provide uh, um, uh, comments or to ask for questions. So let me just uh, reopen the Mentimeter. I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, Ellie, can you help me in case? There are uh, some in the Q and A. Yes. Okay. So we can maybe take it uh, uh, while we ask people to. To connect. Yes. Yeah. So let's see. There's one uh, generic question, maybe for the end of the session. What is your opinion about illegal or illegal websites like SciHub that offer access to a lot of papers that are not available otherwise? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yes, just, um, uh, just a comment about this. If you all 
make available your own products via your institutional or uh, um, thematic repository, then we, there will be no need for these illegal tools because we are using them because we have uh, the paywalls and we can, if we can skip the paywalls and everyone makes its own research completely available, we will not lead, need illegal tools. This is uh, my comment. <laughs> To this yeah and if you are uh, looking for articles in sci-hub then why not publish your own in open access so mm -hmm. you don't so you don't have to do it anymore yeah so you don't have to go illegal you can go mm -hmm. legal okay so uh, i see there are more questions yes so will this open research publishing platform ranked in rankings like <laughs> other journals uh, Yes, the or the question is absolutely no, because uh, the European Commission has uh, signed the, the, the Plan S um, and has uh, so many things into place uh, regarding also the change in the evaluation system. Uh, I can tell you this because uh, uh, this I didn't tell you, but Open Air is involved in the dissemination process of the European Open Research uh, Europe platform. So Ellie and I are both involved in the um, dissemination of this new platform and we have um, uh, a channel open for um, for uh, a discussion with the people that are designing and implementing the platform. So I personally asked this to the representative of the European Commission that uh, presented us the platform and she said absolutely no. So uh, there will be no impact factor for uh, the, the Open Research Europe. There will be no ranking because mm -hmm. this is something that they want to uh, avoid. Uh, Ellie, do you want to read the next question? Yes, because it was it was a question uh, to provide more information about open peer review, but that was uh, covered uh, during okay. the presentation. So, but there is a, I, I left this because there's a good uh, statement here. So okay. It says, I do not, I do think that this model, open peer review, generates significant pressure on the reviewer and some people might prefer to not invo be involved in open review process. Oh, really? And I would, okay. uh, I think I've, I've, I've heard that before, I've seen that before, and I think one of the key um, things that uh, people would feel more relu reluctant in uh, offering the review is, I guess, the question to all, how do you do your peer review? Do you have guidelines that you follow? How, do you have specific guidelines? Because we see that uh, people need to be trained even for that uh, specific process of the uh, open of publishing in general. Yeah, this is there, interesting. There are efforts. There are efforts for uh, academic libraries and different other institutions and initiatives that uh, are providing such um, such trainings. And I believe this is one thing we have guidelines and yes, there is a learning curve and it's always blind. Okay, I'm also reading the, the chat, sorry. Okay, I don't um, know if uh, this person wants to open uh, his or her mic to explain better. This is a very nice uh, discussion topic. So why should uh, a reviewer feel pressure for um, open peer review? I don't know who, who posed this question. If uh, if you want to to uh, discuss openly, you can raise your hand so we understand that, that uh, you are up on it. I can uh, I can understand the pressure for an early career researcher, mm -hmm. but again, um, this is uh, one of uh, this is a contribution. This is yes. how I think we should see it, like a contribution to. Yes. So, Julia, I'm opening uh, your mic so you can uh, explain. Is that uh, okay with you? Uh, let me check. Okay, I just see. Okay, you have your ra your hand raised. I also see that uh, Stephen Sig asked for for. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, 
I do understand the, the comment about the pressure on doing a, a review, because especially if it's public with your name, because if you basically advise not to review something, you're going against other researchers. And then, especially at early stages of your career, but even after, like there are rankings, there is people that is more famous than you. Are you gonna like reject a paper that is from somebody that maybe it might have bad repercussions to your career? So I think the pressure might be might be here. And then of course, I do agree that review should be considered as a, as a, as a contribution, um, which right now is the work that we do that is not seen everywhere, anywhere. But I, I guess the pressure is here. And I, would, I, I participated in an open review process in the last robotics and science and systems, I was a reviewer and there was an open system. That means that the reviews were published, but not with the name. So mm -hmm. you could mm -hmm. access the reviews, but but they were not assigned uh, yes. to, to there yourself. Are, yeah, there are different uh, traits uh, when we yes. talk about open peer review. Mm -hmm. This is one, one of the methods, let's say. That the yes. reviews are shared openly, but not uh, but you know with uh, by name. Um, this is fully open peer review, the, the one. Yeah, 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 I understand. And I like the proposal, but the, the comment that has been about the pressure on, on, on researchers, I agree that depending who the author of the main paper is, it might be difficult to reject. You might feel like, oh, this is, is, they are going to be upset with me. And these people that then you're going to find in congresses and, and maybe people that you want to collaborate with. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes I, I completely understand your point. Yes. Uh, I think still we have this bias because of the pressure that we have in publishing. So this is linked to this because yes. uh, the publish is, is the only way that we have to be evaluated and we need to, to have many papers and we need to. So uh, this partially solve the problem because this, this platform will not be included in this system for evaluation. Do you understand what I mean? Because they yes. will not have an impact factor. So publishing in this uh, um, uh, open research publishing platform will have a different meaning, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but this at, is... at some point, though, there has to be a change on how we as yes. researchers are, are evaluated. Like, if yes. no longer having papers on Q1 is important, then I don't care putting my best work on this platform. Yes. But if then this is going to be something that I cannot show as publications when I have to access a position in my institution, because the only thing that they care is how many Q1 papers I have. That's a, a pro, like that's a problem. Like then I cannot put my work on this platform that I really like the proposal and I really like how it's gonna work and I think it solves a lot of problems. But then because and I understand why it will not have a ranking and when it will like I agree on that. But then at the same time something needs to change. Yes. For, exactly. Thanks. But the thing is now we are in the middle of the change. Okay. Now, this is uh, for us a very good opportunity because the discussion on the new evaluation system is happening now. So mm -hmm. this is the time where all the different uh, researchers and in particular the different research communities can have their say on how they uh, think. For, of their thought for a new evaluation system. Of course, this is a transition period. So uh, things will change. We do not know how, but uh, what we need to do is to set into place and develop all the tools that yeah. we will need. Mm -hmm. So this is a step in this process. Yes. I think, if I understand correctly, you, there's also the institutional aspect in your uh, commentary. Like you mentioned that, okay, I can, I, I will do that, but my institution won't, uh, you know, approve or will not consider that, for example, for a promotion or a tenure, I guess. Yes. Uh, exactly. And That's this the is- the case in my institution. Like, uh, I know. 
but the European Commission uh, urges and uh, you know they have uh, these uh, com communications and directives and recommendations that uh, they like the communication for open for access to and preservation of scientific information uh, that they uh, urge all the countries and member states of Europe to adopt their national law in that yeah. so mm -hmm. things things are starting to you know move towards that direction this will take of course time but I we see that um, researchers practice and policy measures should go in parallel in order to you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Have I see a, a conflict yeah. the moment where the, the curriculum of people are going to change from day to night when this changes because maybe you have been building your CV so it has a lot of Q1 journals and maybe other people that they don't and uh, they are considered like with less possibilities of getting these positions and then from day to like from the next one day to the next one maybe this is not going to matter and the only thing that matters is the, the number of publications without I understand, I, I just see difficult the change because mm -hmm. maybe some people are not going to be interested in this change because maybe then mm -hmm. they're going to have, I don't know, because we've been working towards building a CV with some rules and now these, two, these rules have to change. And yes. I agree that they have to change, but at the same time, it's like... Mm. Yeah, but, but if I can make a comment here, uh, there is a, a, a system that they are using, for example, in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is one of the countries that is most advanced in the uptake of open science. This is also because uh, uh, of, of uh, something that happened in the past with a, a, a researcher that uh, built fake data to publish uh, uh, a new research line and this was a, a major um, how to say um, something that really uh, broke the the, um, uh, the the how to say that the way that citizen viewed uh, the science so they really are now one of the country most advanced and mm -hmm. what they do is that they already created a new way of assessing a researcher in their career but they offer you to follow the old rules or the new ones okay so when you will be okay. evaluated for a new position you can say either i want to go for the old uh, model because I'm a very, um, you, you know, I'm an older yeah. researcher and I built my career on that, or I prefer to be evaluated with the new metrics because I am a new career researcher and I, I am, mm -hmm. I did, yes. It's so It's interesting, yeah. Yes, this is one thing that I found very uh, practical also because uh, in, in a transition period, you will need uh, some, uh, uh, how to say, some flexibility also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I see someone with a conflict of interest. <laughs> I don't know who this is from the comments in the Mentimeter. Um, so uh, we are already 10 minutes uh, behind the, our time. Uh, I see no other questions. And also I see no comments in the Menti. Uh, and uh, so uh, if, uh, I don't know, Ahmad, if you want to close uh, this first module and then we can, um, we can uh, see each other on Friday. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so I, I'd like to thank you very much, actually. It was a very nice discussion and presentation. Um, so yes, I, I just wanted just to add a, a, a short comment. Uh, the new policy, so the one that will be valid for the next call, the call 2020, will be released with the call announcement later in December, so within this month. And the big change, as I said in the beginning, is is now the, the full commitment to open science in terms of open data, open sharing, open sharing of research data is no longer uh, just an encouragement, but rather um, an obligation to be to be followed. Uh, of course, always uh, with a principle as open as possible, as closed as necessary. 
Um, so with this, again, thanks a lot. I think there were lots of uh, interesting discussions within the conversation and within the Q&A. And I'm very much looking forward to, to the next session in two days. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, so uh, we will release the presentation soon. I think in Zenodo, uh, Ahmad, also for you. And I see you on Friday. Thank you.